Good evening and thank you for joining us for this live stream presentation, A Day in the Life of a Wildlife Rehabilitator with the New Mexico Wildlife Center. My name is Ashley Lusher, the Gift Shop and Programs Coordinator at the Pajarito Environmental Education Center, better known as PEAK, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. I will be your moderator for tonight. The Los Alamos Nature Center is currently closed, but we still have lots of ways you can interact and connect with nature. Check out the PEAK website, peaknature.org, for more live stream presentations like this one, on your own activities like our Trails Passport, and even some small group in-person programs. PEAK is able to offer programs at this time because of our wonderful donors and members. So the New Mexico Wildlife Center is a nonprofit organization that focuses on connecting people and wildlife for an abundant tomorrow. Throughout their education programs and on-site tours, the organization reaches thousands of New Mexicans every year. The Wildlife Hospital takes over 700 wild animals each year. Uh, so without further ado, I will pass on the talk to Jessica and Haley. You guys should be able to share now. Fantastic, thank you so much, Ashley. We're gonna go ahead and share our PowerPoint right now to get us started. So we're gonna talk about a day in the life of a wildlife rehabilitator. I am Jessica, I am the site manager here at New Mexico Wildlife Center. And next to me, I have Haley, our lovely wildlife rehabilitator, who's gonna be doing most of the talking today. <laughs> um, so just a little bit about our center. Ashley kind of already talked about it, but just a little bit more. So like she said, our mission is to connect people and wildlife for an abundant tomorrow. And we do that through a few different programs. We do that through our wildlife hospital, which we're gonna talk about today. And we do that through wildlife rehabilitation, as well as internships through our hospital. Um, we also have a really big education side. So we have 40 ambassador animals that are non-releasable that permanently live at New Mexico Wildlife Center. And they help us to educate the public by creating those um, nice intimate connections between people and wildlife. So we offer all, we offer virtual education programs, on-site education programs and off-site education programs. Um, and we've been doing a lot more virtual education this year <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, we also have a whole bunch of volunteers that help our center function. We have about 25 education volunteers, 15 wildlife hospital volunteers, and 50 transporters. Our transporters are folks located all over New Mexico who we can pick up the phone and call if we need any help transporting an animal to our center. So we oftentimes get calls from people who have an injured animal and they don't have a car or they have to go to work. And so these transporters help to get the animal to us and we're very, very thankful for that. Um, there are seven staff members here at New Mexico Wildlife Center. Um, and so we do not have the time to go drive out and pick up the animals. So these transporters really help with that. So. They're vital to our operation. Yes, they are. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Haley introduce herself. So hello everyone. Um, I am Haley Sharp, one of the full-time wildlife rehabilitators here. Um, so a little bit of my background is um, I got a Bachelor of Science in Biology with an Environmental Science minor from the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. Um, and that is also where I started my wildlife rehabilitation career. Um, so I actually started with an internship at the Bay Beach Wildlife Sanctuary um, all the way back in 2012. Um, from there, I moved to Oklahoma, um, where I became an intern and eventually a small mammal team leader. Um, in 2014 and 2015. Um, and then I was able to move to New Mexico and get a full-time position in 2018. Um, and I became a certified wildlife rehabilitator in 2018 that fall. Awesome. Um, so what is wildlife rehabilitation? Um, this is actually a question that we get a lot. A lot of people want to know are we veterinarians? Um, what, do we, what do we really do here? Um, so wildlife rehabilitation really involves the medical side of animal care. Um, so we work very closely with um, veterinarians and other wildlife organizations to make sure that each animal and patient is getting the best care possible. Um, we provide a lot of the first aid and the triage. So when an animal first comes in, um, we're like the first responder type. Um, and part of that involves understanding their natural histories, um, how to work with all of the various species safely, 
Um, and then we do a lot of problem solving with the public on the phone. Cool. So can anyone just become a wildlife rehabilitator? Like, can I just do it in my living room? So no, you can't just do it from your living room, but yes, any person is able to become a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, so how do I do that? Um, this field is actually very quickly evolving. Um, it was started in the 80s and from there it is become this huge thing. Um, so it started off as people just doing it in their living rooms, but from there we have tried to become more professional um, throughout the country. Um, so most of the ways that you will start out doing this is going to school to get a degree. Um, most organizations now would like to have their wildlife rehabilitators to have a degree in something related to the field. Um, and becoming a licensed vet tech um, is actually really helpful in our field because we're trying to become more and more like a vet office doing like blood work um, and fecals and all that kind of stuff. Um, if schooling isn't really your path, then you can do volunteering. Um, that is the best way to start off becoming a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, and then from there going and doing internships. Um, and the more and varied an internship that you can get, the better for your overall career, just because this field is very limited in the profession. Um, so having a wide range of knowledge is going to help you getting a job wherever you might be able to get one. And then once you have a state of residence that you want to work with, each state has a different regulation. Um, so like in New Mexico, in order to become one, you have to have an appropriate facility um, or have the plan and the money to set up a facility. You have to have two years with an already licensed wildlife rehabilitator. Um, this wildlife rehabilitator does not need to be from New Mexico. And then you also have to have a vet who wants to work with you. Cool. How long does it usually take for someone to become a wildlife rehabilitator? So that's hard to answer. Um, every person is going to be different. I mean, obviously, from my internship career to getting a full time job was about six years. Um, some people can do it in much less time. Some people it takes even longer. Um, so it kind of just depends on the experience that you gain and any of your education. Hmm. So Haley, I've taken care of a lot of dogs and cats. <laughs> Is wildlife rehabilitation really that much different? Like, couldn't I just go out and take a squirrel and take care of it? It's similar to a cat, right? So yes, it's easy to think that you know how to act around animals and you can apply that to wildlife, um, but it's actually very different. So dogs and cats have been domesticated and they're used to being around people. Wildlife, we are still considered predators to them. So it's a completely different way of acting. Hmm, okay. And what can happen if someone does take care of a wild animal and it doesn't go well? Like if someone decides they just wanna take care of a squirrel themselves, what can go wrong? So actually lots of things. Um, so the way that we do it is we continue to teach them how to be a squirrel. And most people that take them into their houses and living rooms treat them as a pet. So then they become humanized um, and they don't actually understand how to be a squirrel in the wild. So then when they just release them thinking that they're good and they're old enough, um, this squirrel has no idea what it's doing. It doesn't know how to find food. It doesn't know how to cache food. It might not even realize that it's a squirrel. Um, so a lot of things can go wrong. Okay, so what should I do if I find a wild animal? So what you should do is always call a licensed wildlife rehabilitator before you take any sort of action. Um, we are going to be able to walk through the situation with you and actually determine if this is an animal that needs help or if like the picture that you can see here, if it's just a fledgling, sometimes they leave the nest before they actually know what they're doing. Um, and they often end up on the ground and then people think that they're injured, but mom and dad are still around and taking care of them. Um, so we can help you figure out the steps you need to take to figure out if that's happening um, or if this is something that is actually injured and needs help. If it is injured and needs help or is determined to actually be um, orphaned, you're gonna to wanna to put it into some sort of container, um, like a cardboard box with um, holes punched into it um, and a towel at the bottom. And you wanna keep it in a warm, dark and quiet location until you can transport it to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. And also very importantly, do not give them food or water. Um, food because people typically give them the wrong things for their species. 
And then water, because if they're injured and they have anything going on with their head, um, it's very easy for them to fall over and then drown in any sort of water container. Hmm. Cool. Well, I think that we all know a lot more about wildlife rehabilitation now. And I think we should go show our audience uh, our wildlife hospital. What do you think? Yes. Cool. Um, oh, well, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> so first, we're just we'll going to talk, talk a little quick. bit about our wildlife hospital first. Um, so we take in hundreds of patients every year. Um, last year, we did 996. We we're only four away from hitting the thousand mark. Um, and just some background from that, in 2019, we did 693, I think. So we were quite over what we are anticipating in 2020. Of those, 691 of them were birds. <laughs> um, 285 of them were mammals. We had 16 reptiles, three amphibians, and one insect. <laughs> <laughs> which normally insects are not admitted into hospitals um but this lady was very concerned so we decided to just take it in <laughs> insects seem very difficult yes uh, there's not a lot that i can do for them <laughs> cool okay well with that do we want to go check out our wildlife yes, hospital let's go. okay awesome let me close this up and get back to our zoom and stop our sharing okay Okay, one second. It's thinking. <laughs> That's weird. It looks like we have been switched so that we cannot start our video, and I'm not sure why. Sorry about that. I think that we had a slight setting issue. Go ahead and try again now. There we go. Okay, hey, perfect. perfect. <laughs> okay, so we're going to walk you over to our wildlife hospital. And while we're doing that, we'll kind of give you a tour of our inside area. It's not as exciting as our outside area or our wildlife hospital. Here's our classroom, our makeshift virtual classroom that we've got going on during the pandemic. We've got our lobby with some of our, oh wow, our noisy magpies checking in. <laughs> and our hallway down to our wildlife hospital. The nice thing about our wildlife hospital is it is kind of tucked into the back, um, which is ideal because it was, it has a little bit less noise back here um, and it's kind of tucked away from the public. So this is our beautiful wildlife hospital. All right, I'm gonna take off my mask because now I'm gonna step away from Jessica and this way you guys can still hear me. Can we turn on this light right here, Haley, really quickly? Sure. So I am currently standing in our intake area. Um, so when you bring an animal to our hospital, this is the first place that they're going to come. Um, so this is where I'm going to get them out of the transport container and I'm going to assess what is wrong with them. Um, as you can see, all of my medical supplies and medications and anything I might need is easily available to me. And it also houses the area for um, some of our diagnostic machines. How are you able to keep medications here? So we actually work with a vet and a pharmacist um, who comes out monthly to make sure that we are keeping our pharmacy um, under control and that we're doing everything correctly and legally. Cool. So if you guys follow me around this corner, over here, this is our x-ray machine. Um, as you can see, it's rather old. Um, most vet offices and doctor's offices now have turned to digital. Um, but we actually still have to process all of our x-rays. Um, that being said, we are very lucky to have this piece of machinery here because um, it really helps us nail down what is actually wrong. You know, we can only feel so much through soft tissue um, and this shows us exactly what's happening. Cool. And over to my left, this is our surgery suite. Um, and this is actually its first debut after being renovated. Um, so this winter, this is one of our big projects was renovating this room. Um, we painted the walls, we got new tables and cabinets. Um, so as you can see, it looks much more like a surgery suite so that um, when our vet is here and able to do surgeries, everything is where it needs to be and also easily accessible. 
And this is thanks to the Thaw Charitable Trust yes. <laughs> for providing us the funds to do this. We were very, very fortunate to get some money from them to make some much needed renovations to the inside of our wildlife hospital. Yeah. So if you turn around and go back that direction, you can see this is our diet prep area. Um, so we have a couple of our tables. We have a lot of our dry goods that we use regularly. Um, we do a lot of diet prep. So we have to chop up fruits and vegetables. And depending on the species and the natural history, we have insects and we have seeds and we have all sorts of different things. Um, so this is kind of where we centralize that so that everything that we use frequently is easily on hand. Cool. And then just over in this corner is <laughs> where the mundane things happen. <laughs> um, so every day we have to do dishes and laundry um, and it's a constant upkeep as I'm sure anyone who has raised children knows um, essentially what we're doing is just constantly cleaning up after that. <laughs> um, and then the other three rooms that you need to see are going to be mammals over here. And then over in this corner, we have our songbird room. And back by where we entered is where our raptor room is. And why can't we go in there? So the reason that we cannot go in there is because we do have patients in there right now um, and we're not legally able to show them to you. Um, it is part of our permitting that we can't put them on display. And it's also very stressful for them, for us to be walking in there and talking. Um, so we try to limit that as much as possible. Cool. Awesome. And your office, which looks very exciting. <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> cool. Well, it looks like we have an animal that needs to be examined. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, so this turkey vulture was just brought to us. Um, and I'm going to perform one of my initial exams on it to try and see what's wrong. Um, so each rehabilitator kind of has their own process, um, but we teach ourselves to do this the same way every single time so that if it's like actively bleeding from somewhere or has a huge fracture, we aren't missing some any of the smaller things that might be happening with it. Um, so I usually do head to toe and left, uh, right side and left side. So I will start with the face. And if this was a real turkey vulture, I would be wearing like actual gloves. So, <laughs> as you can see, we have a bunch of different options. So we have small ones for some of the smaller raptors and we have thicker ones for big ones like turkey vultures. Um, and then we would wear night trial gloves um, for any of, any of the exams that we do. Um, I'm not going to put a pair on right now because they're a hot commodity right now and it's really expensive. <laughs> So I will start at the head and I will look at the beak, make sure there's nothing wrong there, make sure that the eyes and the pupils are reacting normally, open its mouth, check its mucous membranes, see what color those are, check hydration levels, um, move down the body. I will open up the wing, see what's wrong with all of the bones in here, move down the side, check the leg, check the feet, check the bottom of the feet. Then I'll start over. Normally I skip the head because I'm looking at both eyes and I want to see the differences between them. So I'll start on this wing, check all the bones, check on this leg, check the feet. And then from there, I will fill out one of our intake exam sheets. So this is kind of all of the different things that we want to be looking for. Cool. In this turkey vultures case, <laughs> what did you find? We're going to say that I found a fracture in the right radius ulna. Where's the radius ulna? So the radius ulna, I'm actually gonna show on oh, hey. It's gonna be the two bones that are in this part. In a bird, the humerus is here, and then it kind of turns, and then you have the radius ulna, and then you have the metatarsals. Because they basically have like long fingers as well at the yeah. very end. Yeah, so they basically have almost the same kind of bone structure. It's just very elongated. Okay, cool. So you said there's a fracture at its what? Radius ulna. Radius ulna. <laughs> okay, and then what would you do from here? So from here, I would actually go and take an x if this is the kind of thing that we want to have surgery and pin, or if this is something we can just wrap. Okay. Um, if it's something that we can wrap, I don't need to get a vet involved and I can just do the wrap myself. If it needs surgery, I do have to call our vet. How long would it normally take for something like that to heal? Um, it kind of depends on the fracture, but typically we say six to eight weeks. 
Um, and then there's usually a month of them regaining all their flight muscles. And when you release it, do you usually try to release it back into the same area? So that also depends. <laughs> um, if it is a baby or a fledgling or something and it didn't have an established territory already, um, we'll just try to pick an area where there are already adults so it can learn from them. If it is an adult, we do try to get it within five miles of where it was found because it does mean that it probably already has an established area or it already knows the resources there. Hmm. Okay, cool. What do you think is the most common injury or reason for intake that you see in animals here at New Mexico Wildlife Center? So injuries, it's definitely dependent on the time of year. Um, so like right now we're getting a lot of um, conjunctivitis house finches, which is basically their version of pink eye. Um, in the winter, we get a lot of barbed wire great horned owls. Um, and in the summer, it's just a lot of babies. Um, our biggest reason for intakes though, are cats. So if you have a domestic cat, it's very important that you keep them inside or you build them some sort of like catio um, or you put those collars on them. Um, we have found that bells actually don't work that well. Um, the birds get used to the jingle and then it becomes background noise and it doesn't um, warn them that the cat is coming. Hmm. So talking about ways that we can help prevent wildlife from getting into the wildlife hospital, like keeping our cats indoors, what are some other ways that we can help prevent wildlife from becoming injured or sick? Um, so one of the big ones is to not use poison ever. Um, it compounds in predators. So you may think that you're just putting a little bit of poison out for some rats or something, um, but then a coyote or an owl or a hawk um, or even possibly your own cat is going to eat them and it compounds in their body and becomes toxic. Um, and it kills a lot of predators. Um, some of the other ways are with like the conjunctivitis thing. Um, if you put out bird seed or have a bird bath um, once a week, taking them down and cleaning them with a warm soapy solution and then bleaching them um, can stop the spread because they become gathering points. I know we've gotten a lot of those in the past couple months. Yeah, um, and it's treatable, but it takes a really long time. It takes like a month and a half for them to be cured of this virus. Mm -hmm. So anything that you can do to help is, is beneficial. What about windows? I know we get a lot of window collisions. We do get window collisions. Um, and our favorite thing to use are the UV decals. Mm. Um, we get just a tape one and you put it up in like a bar type of pattern. Um, but you can get prettier designs and they're all over Amazon. Um, I'm pretty sure most Wild Birds Unlimited carry them. So they're, they're pretty easy to find. I got some gorgeous uh, bird silhouette shaped decals to put all over my windows. I have on my yeah. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Well, can you think of any other things that people should be aware of in terms of how to prevent wildlife from coming into our hospital? I think those are probably the main ones. I think those are the big ones. Um, that we encounter the most often. Definitely just like cats, poison, um, and just keeping up your yards clean. Cool, awesome. Well, do you have anything else you wanna show us in the hospital? I don't think so. I think you guys saw everything. Well, uh, what other questions do we have for Haley? Um, well, so if somebody is to come and visit the Nature Center, are they able to walk around and see those outdoor areas in person? So um, unfortunately, the hospital is not available to the public at all, um, except for very few occasions when we hold events here, um, which is why we try to do things like this so people can kind of see what we do down here. Um, but the outdoor enclosures on our education side are, so you are able to come and tour and see all of our animal ambassadors. Yeah, and that's just to make sure that they're kind of calm back here and we don't want a lot of people back here to make noise right. and and disturb the wildlife. Everything we can do to keep them not used to humans is what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of some of the stuff that like Hillary and I do, um, we don't wear perfume, we don't name any of the animals, um, and we don't walk into their um, rooms unless we need to work with an animal or clean in there. Um, and we try to keep talking to a minimum when we are in them. I know you oftentimes turn your phones off too, or you turn them on yes. silent so the phone noises don't go off. Yes. Um, so we either keep our phones on silent or we just keep them in our office. Mm -hmm. Cool. I know that sometimes you say that you try to house animals together when they're younger as well. Like 
like babies together so that they are kind of getting yeah. used to their own species and, yeah, and less so you never want to raise a single mammal um so you do want them to grow up with others of their species so if we get a single squirrel and we have a group of two that are the same size we'll actually introduce them together um and you are able to do that up to a point um but again <laughs> kind of just comes with experience knowing what sizes are good together yeah cool any other questions uh yes do <laughs> you let people know what happens to the animals that they rescue and bring in yes um so we actually have a different form that the rescuers have to fill out um so that we kind of know where the animal came from and the circumstances of how they found them and on that we have a box asking if that person would like to receive um and we actually just changed it over to email about what happened to their to that patient. And how do you keep track of all of the patients? Um, so we use an online database um, called WORMED, which is Wildlife Rehabilitation Medical Database. <laughs> um, and it actually assigns an intake number. Um, so at the beginning of the year, we start over at one um, and we go all the way through and it, go, it counts up to however many intakes we have that year. Cool. Do you ever get animals with trap injuries, such as a leg hole? Mm -hmm. uh, and if so, how often and what species? That's a good question. So we actually don't get that many that are from like the traditional um, like lake traps. Um, we get a lot of live trap injuries, <laughs> which is kind of counterintuitive because a lot of people use them because they don't want animals to get hurt. Um, but it's usually self-inflicted so the animal is um they're not used to being in confined small spaces like that um so they're constantly like pushing their noses out or reaching their um, hands through um and they come in a lot of times with like major scrapes um on their faces and their hands hmm. cool. um we also have <laughs> trap is kind of a relative term here because we also use that as like trapped in your house or trapped in a chimney um, which we do also get quite a few of those. We had a very interesting bird that was stuck in yes. a stovepipe recently, right? Yes, uh, covered in suit, um, otherwise uninjured, um, but we did have to give him quite a few baths to get all of the suit out of his feathers. It was a very black colored curved billed thrasher yeah. for a while. <laughs> it was very weird. <laughs> and then from each progressive bath, like just a little bit of his streaking would come out and then a little bit more and he slowly got to look like an actual curved billed thrasher. Yeah. <laughs> That was crazy. Well, why don't we walk back to the virtual classroom while we keep answering questions because my arms are weak and getting tired. <laughs> so let's head back that way. Uh, Ashley, feel free to ask, uh, continue asking questions. Yes, um, are there complications to worry about when an animal is recovering from surgery? Hmm. Yes, so um, obviously it's just as invasive as human surgery. Um, so we always have to think about is the incision site healing okay? Um, did we, you know, contaminate the, the bone or the inside tissue? Um, so we're always looking for like infection or, you know, um, something's not healing right on the surface. Um, so there's definitely still all those complications. Switch it back this way. Okay. What other questions do we have? Um, how many animals do you get on average each month? Each month? Oh, each month. That's actually very interesting. Um, so from May to probably like September, that's what we consider baby season. And we have a huge spike in intake. Um, that's where the majority of our numbers come each, each year. Um, so what was, our, think, what was our record last year? Yeah, I think we had a crazy day last year. I think we had 18 patients in one day in the summer last year. Um, so <laughs> if you have three days of that, that's a lot of patients. Yes. Um, on top of the 60 other patients we're currently still raising. Um, so baby season is, is very busy yes. <laughs> and stressful. Um, but in the winters, it's probably like three to four a week. During baby season, that's when we all know to leave Hillary and Haley alone because we know that they are scrambling to take care of an amazing amount of animals. And we're very fortunate this year, we're going to be having a seasonal wildlife rehabilitator join our team. So we'll have three 
during the busy season. We will also be having a vet join our team for the busy season, which is going to be yes. phenomenal. And we will have four interns. Yes. So this year we're really setting ourselves up for success in terms of our wildlife hospital. And we're really hoping that Hillary and Haley don't get as worn out <laughs> during this crazy season. It's, it's very crazy. And yeah, most days we're like, we don't have time to talk to literally anyone else on the staff. We only worry about the hospital. <laughs> so something that might be interesting to mention um, that some people might not have heard of is compassion fatigue. Oh yeah. Um, so if anyone's in the medical field, they've probably heard of this. It actually afflicts um, nurses and vets very commonly. Um, and it they're still trying to kind of figure out what exactly compassion fatigue is, um, but they think it's a lesser form of PTSD. Um, so basically it's when you get past the point of burnout um, and you become so unconcerned about what's happening day to day. You don't care about your coworkers. You don't care about the patients anymore. Um, and it usually results from a very specific patient um, that you've either been working with for a while and it, they die or um, it was a really traumatic intake or something like that. Um, so it actually is a really big concern in our field. Mm -hmm. um, and we take steps to combat that in the busy seasons when it's more likely to happen. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes some of the other staff members will try to step in and give yeah. our wildlife rehabilitators a break. Um, we'll try to provide them with uh, any kind of mental um, distractions we can from their job because it can be very, very, very yeah. hard. And a big one for that, like combating that is having um, hobbies outside of work that don't involve animals. Mm -hmm. um, so I do a lot of hiking. Um, I like to crochet. Um, so things like that, exercise is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and then just making sure that you're able to separate work from home mm -hmm. um, so that you don't go home and you're constantly thinking about what happened that day. <laughs> um, kind of have to have that yep. separate piece, which is why our commute is so nice. <laughs> yes, we have a beautiful commute from, we both live in Santa Fe. <laughs> Our center is located just south of Espanola. Um, and so it's about a 25 minute drive every morning and it is beautiful. <laughs> and it's that's the time where I take, when I'm my, on my way home, I process everything that happened that day. I learn what I could have done better, what went wrong or what I need to address tomorrow. And then when I get home, I'm done. And then I can focus on me um, and my relationships at home. Yeah, cool. What other questions do we have? Oh, we have a couple. Do the public ever get to see rehabilitated animals released? Hmm. Um, so it kind of depends. Um, we involve the public as much as possible, um, but we don't like to do large releases because it's already very stressful to be in the car until whenever we reach the release site. Um, and then to have like a lot of people around is very stressful for them when they're also being introduced to a brand new environment. Um, that being said, if it's something like, like an eagle um, or like with our squirrel campaign um, and we can control the numbers and keep it to a minimum, um, we will try to involve either the rescuer or um, some of the public. Mm -hmm. That is very cool. I'm sure it's so rewarding to get to watch those animals go back out yes. into their habitat. <laughs> it's like the best part of the day. It really is. <laughs> um, I'm going to let you continue answering questions. I am going to go grab our little guest that's going to be joining us shortly. Lovely. Um, well, our next question is a little bit similar to the last. I know you mentioned that with raptors, you try to release them in the same area that they were rescued, but with other animals, how do you decide where to release them back into the wild? So um, with like mammals, um, New Mexico Department of Game and Fish dictates that we have to release within the same county. Um, so then depending on the mammal, like if it's a cottontail, they can pretty much live anywhere. So I'll try to just take them back to that area. Um, but if it's like a, a nuisance animal, like a skunk or a squirrel or something, um, I'll try to usually find something that's a little bit like greener um, and a little bit more rural away from people. Um, and then with babies, especially with like songbirds, um, we always try to go on eBird and find out where the adults already are and release them into a population of adults. Um, especially if it's a migratory species, we want to make sure that they have a big group to migrate with. Sorry, I thought I had unmuted. <laughs> uh, 
another bird question. You mentioned um, having a great horn owl that was injured from a fence strike. How often does that happen? And is that a barbed wire fence or any fence? Um, so usually it is a barbed wire fence. Um, we don't typically get them from any other kind of fencing, although we will get songbirds that get stuck in chain link fences. Um, the reason why it happens more in the winter is because they like to hunt from the, the posts of the fence or from a tree on the side of the road. And then when they swoop down, they end up hitting the fence um, and they become entangled. And then it happens more in the winter because the prey is more easily hunted in road sides um, as opposed to in the summer when they're all over the place. I know this last um, early fall, I found a songbird that had perched on a metal fence and then a big freeze came through and its foot was frozen to the fence. <gasps> And luckily I was able to very gently warm it up just enough. I don't think it had been there for more than a few minutes, but yeah. it was very much stuck, but it flew away fine. And uh, yeah. I can only imagine when it's those larger birds, it becomes even more dramatic. This, yeah, and, and this fall was really hard on songbirds. So I'm glad that you were able to save that one. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned how um, poison can be really dangerous for a lot of the wildlife. Can you test an animal for rodent poisoning? Uh, also, do you get many with lead poisoning? Um, and how would they get that poisoning? Okay, um, so with like rat poisoning, um, there's not really a good way to test it. Um, it's really hard to just take like a blood sample and know this animal was poisoned. Um, generally, we can deduce from the symptoms that we see that we always see with poison victims. Um, so, so it's like, like seizures or um, a certain kind of neurologic condition. Um, and then in the really severe cases, they do actually vomit the green um, substance. Um, so that's a really good indicator. Um, with lead poisoning, we do get to eagles with lead poisoning. Um, those are generally the only ones that really present with um, that specific kind of poison. Um, and that we can do by a blood sample. We have a lead analyzer um, in-house, so we are able to do that right there. Um, and they, they mostly get it from fishing lures that end up in um, the fish that they're catching. Gotcha. So I assume um, making sure if you are fishing, cleaning up after yourself and making sure that you're not leaving supplies out for animals to consume, that could be something that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you want to switch seats? Yes. Um, so we are going to be joined by our guests now, unless we have really vital questions. I'll try to make this quick so if you have any more questions, we can answer them. Here is little Amelia, the American kestrel. <laughs> She's so great. So Amelia was actually a patient from our wildlife hospital. Yes. She came to our wildlife hospital in June of 2020, yes. I think it was. And she came in as a one month old little kestrel. And at one month old, kestrels are almost fully grown. They have almost all their feathers. They're almost the adult size. They've just got a little ways to go. And unfortunately, as soon as she arrived to our hospital, we could tell something was a little bit off. We could tell a human had clearly taken her from the wild and tried to take care of her on their own. We don't know what her story is. Um, no one told us exactly what happened, but she came to our hospital and from day one, we could tell she was a human imprint. So a human imprint happens when an animal imprints on a human instead of its own species. And that imprinting process usually occurs within a first you know, a couple days or, or first week or depending on the species um, of their development. And so instead of having her own parents taking care of her, she likely was being fed and taken care of by humans. From day one, she was food begging from us. She was trying to hop on our shoulders. She had no fear of people whatsoever. At one month old, kestrels should not be food begging from people or anything really. They should be at the age where they're independent. So we knew there was something de developmentally wrong. 
We also noticed her feathers were not really all the way grown in as they should have been. She was also very, very, very tiny. Mm -hmm. And she still is. So we suspect that whoever was taking care of her was not feeding her the proper diet. Because of that, she has very poor feather quality. So I'm kind of, I have her turned around, but you can see her tail feathers are very, very broken and raggedy. And that is unfortunately because when she was growing in her feathers, she was not being fed the proper nutrients needed to make these strong, beautiful feathers. So over the past year, her feathers have broken incredibly easily. You look at her funny and her feathers break. <laughs> it's been a really rough process. Um, she's very, very small for a female kestrel. And she has a really hard time keeping weight on. As soon as the weather drops, we notice her weight drops as well. So we have to keep a really close eye on her to make sure her weight stays at a good level. We also suspect her immune system is probably slightly compromised because of the fact that she was not getting the proper diet during that development period. Because of that, oh, oh, good girl. <laughs> She's so good. Because of that, um, we suspect that she might be prone to infections or other illnesses as well. So we keep a close eye on her. We frequently have our hospital staff do fecals on her to make sure that there's nothing going on internally, any parasites or anything going on. <laughs> she has no idea there's anything wrong with her. As a human imprint, she is very, very comfortable around things that would normally scare other kestrels. The fact that she is this close to a screen with me and Haley standing here, me using my hand very, you know, <laughs> aggressively in front of her, no fear at all. Um, that is a really, a really good sign that she is a human imprint. Um, <laughs> She also doesn't really understand some of the natural behaviors that I yes. would need to see. Mm -hmm. So like she doesn't um, preen normally mm -hmm. um, and she doesn't know how to speak, right? Yes. So <laughs> speaking, speaking is when they clean their beaks off and they usually do that by rubbing their face against like bark or something kind of rough. And that's really important because food will get caked onto their beak and then they can cause bacteria buildup and yeah. grossness. Um, and so we actually have to kind of help her clean her beak um, because she doesn't understand how to do that. Preening is when they use their beak to kind of slick their feathers down. They go back to what they call, uh, what we call a uropygial gland, which produces oil. They get oil on their beak and then they slick their feathers down. So that helps to keep them aerodynamic and also slightly waterproof. And she doesn't know how to do that. Um, she, like I said, she doesn't have fear of many things. If I walk her by our bobcats, uh, which we have on our ambassador animal side, she shows no fear at all, which is a big concern. <laughs> she also doesn't respond to our male American kestrel like an, another American kestrel should. She doesn't recognize him as one of her own species. Whereas he sees her and he's like, a kestrel, oh my gosh. But she, it's, like, it's like he's nothing to her. So she can't recognize kestrels. She sees people and she does food begging still. Um, she actually recognizes my voice from across the center and will trill from across the center at me. Um, so that is a really big sign that there's yeah. something behaviorally wrong. And that's why she cannot be released back into the wild. She would probably come right up to people and ask for food from people and, have, and people would have no idea what was happening. Um, so that's Amelia's story. That's why she is now part of our ambassador animal team. Because she's a human imprint, she uh, quickly settled into our ambassador animal team. She was doing virtual education programs basically from the first month we got her onto our education side. Um, and she has just been phenomenal since. She is such a smart, um, uh, just really great bird to work with. Yeah, so when she actually first came in, I did her intake and that was one of the first things I noticed was that when I went to feed her, she was excited to see me, which is not the case for any of my patients ever. <laughs> um, and so we, we talked as a staff and we were like, well, we have some other young American crystals, like, why don't we try and mm -hmm. see what sh behavior she can um, adapt just by living with them. Um, so we actually gave her probably about a month living with other kestrels, trying to pick, have her pick up those behaviors. And every day that we walked in there, she was constantly ready to take the food from our hands. Um, she, she never got that she was a kestrel. Um, so that's when we did have to talk and make the decision to put her onto our education permit. Um, that is not always the case with the animals that we get. Um, if we get improperly raised 
ex-pets, um, frequently we have to euthanize those because they would not survive in the wild. Um, so that's just part of the, you need to make sure that anything that you find goes to someone who knows how to raise them. Because even if you think that you know what you're doing, it's very possible that later on, I'm going to have to be the one to euthanize it. Yeah, so talking a little bit more about human imprints, um, there's kind of three ways that human imprints can go. Um, one way is they see people as kind of a parent and they food beg. So that's kind of what Amelia sees me as. She sees me kind of as a parent figure and she sees me as the provider of food for her. The second way is they can see you as a mate. Um, and so they can try to court you. We have a turkey vulture named Sol, who we say has a harem of women, who he <laughs> courts every single spring. He makes all these little happy grunty noises and, and he will even uh, incubate uh, tennis balls. Um, he gets so into that kind of courting mode. And then the third way they can go is becoming really aggressive because they see people as competition. They see them as competition for mates. They see them as competition for territory and food. Um, and that's when it can go really, really wrong. Um, we don't want to use an aggressive animal for education programs for obvious reasons. Um, and it takes a really trained professional to make sure that animals are uh, properly taken care of from the beginning to make sure they don't turn into that aggressive state. So, yeah. <laughs> she's just happy and comfy. It's dark, it's, it's her bedtime. So she's just like, oh, I'm just chilling. But I'm curious, I am feeding her a uh, chick right now. So we get, um, chicks and we do get all of our food on our education side and our rehab side frozen already um, so it's frozen and we thaw it out and our ambassador animals get a diverse range of uh, food she gets chicks mice rats quail um, I think that's about it um, so she gets lots of different items um, just to keep her as healthy as possible our hope is that because we've been feeding her this really 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 high nutrient diet that in a few months she will molt all of her feathers and she'll grow in beautiful, strong feathers since she's been getting the proper nutrients. That's the hope. So we'll see. <laughs> I think we'll go ahead and open it up for uh, questions now again. Yeah, we got a couple more questions. <laughs> um, somebody was wondering, what is that term you were using for beak cleaning that they need to do in the wild? And how do you spell that? Oh, that's a good question. It's called feaking. I think it's F-E-A-K. I have no idea. I think it's F-E-A-K. <laughs> um, I've only ever heard it said. I've never actually spelled it. So that's a very good question. <laughs> but yeah, feaking is kind of a, a term that's falconry used. Term? It's a falconry term. Um, so we use a lot of falconry techniques in terms of uh, working with our ambassador animals and um, using equipment that they use in falconry and terms that they use in falconry as well. Gotcha. All right. Um, are there any unusual patient stories that you have that hopefully ended well? Oh, you know, I'm always unprepared for this question. Let's think. Let's think. <laughs> unusual. Um, badger. Oh, yeah, we got a badger this year. It was my first badger in New Mexico. Um, unfortunately, it did not end well. Um, we do believe that it had a disease um, and it succumbed to that within the 48 hours that we had her. Um, we have a crane right now. Mm, that um, was so that's fun. a really cool one, but um, still working on building up those flight muscles. So I don't have an outcome yet for you. Um, Bobcat kittens. I do. We usually get bobcat kittens every summer um and i actually just released this last summer's um two weeks ago mm -hmm. two weeks ago um and those are probably one of my favorite releases because bobcats are so ferocious when they're kittens they like are bored thinking that they're like top of the food chain <laughs> um and then we we have to hold them for such a long time that like i work with them for so long that then seeing them released is probably mm -hmm. one of the most um rewarding of my yeah. releases um you should check out our, our facebook page and instagram we just posted a video recently of that bobcat release and you can see <laughs> you i can am a photographer in the background in case anyone's wondering and she and she failed to take pictures i was so. very distracted by the officers that we were working with that day and was like oh bobcat and there goes my camera and it just didn't work it's a all. great video you can see the, the bobcat just streak by and then Haley's like oh, oh. Bobcat. So. 
check that out. It's pretty funny. Um, unusual in what my favorite animal to rehab is, is um, I actually love to rehab skunks. <laughs> we just got one on Saturday too, and it still smells like skunk here. So I don't smell it. But... <laughs> She's immune to skunk smell. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Um, have you seen any changes in the prevalence of some species or in their seasonal behavior because of drought or clim climate change? Mm, very good question. <sighs> so I can't say that I've been here long enough to really have that kind of determination. Um, I will say that every year we typically have some sort of species that is having a conflict. Um, mm. So like last year's, it was sage feeds. We got a lot of calls of nests and the babies just weren't surviving. Mm -hmm. And they were asking what they could do. And I was like, honestly, like sometimes mother nature just doesn't let us do anything. Um, but I mean, we have like seasons of certain things. So like in the fall, we get a lot of like swings and talks as they're migrating through. Um, and a lot of juvenile Cooper's hawks mm -hmm. as they're trying to figure out how to be Cooper's hawks. Um, yeah. yeah, one thing, one thing we did hear around the center this year is that a lot of birds migrated back early this year. Um, a lot of species were sighted earlier than they normally were. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just, I like to bird watch and I noticed that, um, we saw Swainson's hawks pretty early. Turkey vultures were back pretty early. Um, we got a baby pretty early in yeah. the year as well. This, we got our first baby of the season on March, like third. Yeah. Like that week the, week, the first, the first week, week of, of March. March which was pretty early and we got the late bobcat kittens last year yeah um and honestly like 2020 it's going to be hard to say because it was such a weird mm -hmm. year um because we had such an increase in um of our patient intakes um it's going to be hard to know based off of that data um especially because like I think a lot of it was just that people were home and realizing that there's wildlife in their backyards mm -hmm. Um, and we're around to actually pay attention to it. Um, so it's gonna be hard to say. Um, that being said, 2020 was a year that sucked for a lot of wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, we had the rabbit hemorrhagic disease come out. So that kind of decimated the rabbit population here. Um, we had that songbird die off. Um, and I think a lot of that is probably going to be contributed to climate change, mm -hmm. likely. We actually have a question about that um, die off. Did you mm -hmm. see any victims of the Southwest bird die off? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So I actually probably got about like 10 patients that were alive when they came here um, and ended up dying within the first 24 hours. Um, but we actually also became a collection site for New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. Um, so people could collect the birds from their properties and bring them to us and we cataloged all of those. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, there were some spotted around the Los Alamos area too. So it was mm -hmm. yeah. quite a big thing happening last year. Yeah, it was yeah. crazy. It was really sad. It was, it was sad to kind of answer the door every day and have another person bringing us a bag of dead birds. It was, it was yeah. really, really depressing. It was, it's one of those things where we can't do anything really. All the birds that came in were incredibly emaciated and just, clearly starved to death. And it seems like the report that we just got out mm -hmm. from the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish said that it was primarily um, emaciation. And um, I think some of them did have some lung um, irritation from the fires, yeah. we suspect. Um, but I don't think anyone knows for certain the cause of why all these birds just starved to death. And, um, and it was likely the starvation in combination with the freeze that we got here, um, just kind of hit them all. So it must be hard to get those small animals, um, but what about the larger animals, the uh, large predators, specifically like bears and mountain lions? What do you do when you get calls about those guys? Um, so any large mammal call, we do have to get game and fish involved um, just because the average person doesn't have a way to transport them to us. Um, you know, like if you find a fawn or an elk calf or something and you call us and we determine that, yes, it does need to come to us. Most people can transport those in a dog carrier, um, but anything with um, 
like bobcats, mountain lions, or bear, we would have you call your local officer. Um, we actually don't have the caging available here to raise a bear, um, but luckily Dr. Ramsey is just on the road from us, um, and she is the person in New Mexico who does take all the bear. Um, so we're very lucky to be very close by to her. <laughs> Um, so that that is all the questions that we have gotten so far. Um, and actually, it looks like it's right on time. I see the yeah. time eight o'clock now. <laughs> wow. um, so I'll keep an eye if we have any last minute questions coming in. But I just wanted to say a big thank you to you guys. We've had quite a few comments um, just saying how great this tour has been. Awesome. Um, Good. It's been to get to see all these animals and learn more about them. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for having us. For those who don't already follow us, you can check us out on Facebook and Instagram. We also have a website that we keep up to date with any news. Um, we're also open to visitors uh, Monday through Saturday from nine to four. Um, so be sure to come check out all of our ambassador animals. We have 40 ambassador animals. And so that'll keep you busy for a while. Oh, nice. I know I haven't gotten the chance to come visit the center yet. So I'm looking forward to making a trip down <laughs> Yes, definitely do it. We have a gorgeous uh, scenery surrounding us too. So it's just a great day to spend out here. Oh, well, that sounds beautiful. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and a big thank you to Jessica and Haley for showing us so many of these incredible creatures and talking about them. Um, thanks everybody and have a good night. Bye, thanks everyone. Thanks Ashley, bye-bye.